First of a quest, um, my mom hates it when people call me doctor. Because my dad's a real doctor like you guys. And, you know, I just didn't earn the title in her mind, so um, I'm Yaron, so just call me by my first name. My dad is a doctor. Um, he's an internist, or was an internist, um, at um, a hospital in, uh, in Haifa, Israel. And so I grew up in uh, a family um, with a father who was a physician a very successful physician, a really good physician, under socialized medicine. So I'm here to tell you something you probably already know, but I have first-hand knowledge of this, and you prob guys probably don't. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's really bad. So when my dad, you know, Israel, Israel has amazing doctors, right? Um, you probably meet them at conferences and so on. Uh, uh, you know, after, and it has more doctors per capita than any country in the world by a long shot, you know, because Israel is a Jewish country. So there are lots of doctors. Uh, because that means a lot of Jewish moms who want you to become a doctor. <laughs> and yet, and, and Israel has, you know, given that, it has a very good healthcare system. Uh, but it's still true that if my dad had a patient uh, who, was, who had, uh, you know, something really bad, and who could afford it, they mad, my dad would put him on a plane and fly with him to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, and that was, that, that, that's been true for years and years and years. Um, you know, I'm not going to bore you with all the details and, uh, of, of, of the fact that the United States, in spite of all the statistics that we hear all the time, still has the best healthcare system in the world by a long shot. <laughs> that all the problems in the other healthcare systems, we just are not reported, they're hidden in the statistics, uh, they disappear in aggregation. Uh, the horror stories, nobody has an incentive to report, but, but the, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I mean, uh, the UK is now struggling with figuring out how to move away from the, for the national health system. Even though it's a very popular system, people who actually know anything about it know that it's, it's, it's a disaster and it's crumbling and it's falling apart. Canada is moving slowly towards privatizing elements of its healthcare system, again, kind of under the radar without anybody saying anything. Uh, all these systems that we are trying to emulate, that we are desperately trying to emulate in this country just don't work. And of course, the expert on all that, I think, speaks later today, which is John Goodman, who, will give you, who could give you a lot of information about, uh, about uh, statistics, about how these other systems fail. I want to ask, a question. I want to start off kind of by asking a question. Given that, given that we know our system has problems. Now let's start pretend that this is a, a perfect system. It's far from it. I think we can also pretty much figure out where the problems reside and why they exist. We'll get to that in a minute. But our system is the best system out there in the world. Things like 75% of all medical innovation in the world happen here. Just imagine if we socialize our system and we stop innovating. Everybody in the world suffers. It's not just we suffer. Everybody. Obamacare destroys health care for other people in the world as well because it will lower innovation every, here, and therefore they just buy it right now, and they won't have anything to buy. The question I want to ask is why is this happening? Why is it in spite of all the knowledge that we have about the superiority of our system, the superiority of elements of our system, the fact that their systems don't work, why is it that we're moving towards that? And, and, and here I, I have to say that even if they repeal Obamacare, I don't, you know, it matters, it's important, great, they should repeal Obamacare, but given who the Republicans are, it's not gonna be that big of a deal because they won't repeal many aspects of Obamacare. Maybe the most important one that they won't repeal is the idea of pre-existing conditions, that insurance company has to cover pre-existing conditions. And if you don't repeal that, you've basically destroyed insurance. And if you've destroyed insurance, then the market will collapse at some point, and who will get blamed for it? 
the insurance, greedy insurance companies, and you guys will get blamed for it, and we'll get socialized medicine from Republicans, which is my view anyway, that Republicans will be the ones ultimately to institute this because they'll have no opposition. It always comes from the right. So, you know, why is, why is it so bleak? That is, even if we could get rid of Obamacare, we're, we're going to still have, I mean, Ob uh, Romney is backpedaling dramatically, saying, no, I won't repeal everything, I'll keep the good parts. I mean, he, and, he, and it's not like he's proposing other stuff to replace it that is, that is good. So what is it? What is it about socialized health care? What is it about government involvement in health care that we find so appealing, that our culture finds so appealing, that, that in spite of all the evidence, in spite of all the facts, in spite of all the statistics, you know, we still want to jump off the cliff because that's what it is. It's a cliff. Maybe it's not a cliff, maybe it's a slide, right? Because it's, it's slower, but, but it's basically downwards. And it's a disaster. Um, and, and if you look at the American system today, and you look at what works and what doesn't work, again, you, you, get, the same, you get the same indications, right? As if you look at the American system versus foreign systems, right? What doesn't work in the US system is government involvement. What works in the U.S. system is when you leave it private. So the private sector, the truly private sectors in the U.S. Econ in healthcare system work. It's Medicare and Medicaid that are killing healthcare in the United States, that are driving costs up, that are bankrupting the country, never mind the healthcare industry, that are bank bankrupting the country. Uh, it's all the tinkering that government does with insurance companies, the fact that there's no real in healthcare insurance, no competition in that market, that, they, you know, that there's no robust insurance in this country, that everything is mandate, that everything's controlled. Um, it's the lack of competition, it's the lack of market, it's the lack of privatization. You know, and then the, the most revealing statistic there is, you know, one I'm sure you all are familiar with, of every dollar spent on healthcare in the US, how much is spent by the government? 51 cents. So the government spent 51% of all healthcare dollars in the US. Um, we don't have a private healthcare system. We have a heavily, and that doesn't include regulations and all the different controls that are involved. So even when you look at when we look at our own system, the stuff that doesn't work is government, and the stuff that works is private. So what do we do? We increase the stuff that doesn't work. And by the way, and I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can you can read this in the book. That's the pattern everywhere, everywhere. Right? The entire economy works like this. What parts of the economy work really, really well? Those parts that the, that the government leaves alone. Uh, you know, you're holding up an iPad there. There's very little regulation on iPads. That's why all the geniuses of our culture go into business trying to make phones better. As if that's the most important thing in the world, right? <laughs> what industries are failing? Well, how about education? Education dominated by government. Imagine the, the brain power that goes into developing a little bit better phone going into developing competitive, innovative models in education. No, but that's government, you know, but that's a government thing, so you're never going to get that, right? Um, all our problems seem to be focused, financial crisis and everything, always focused in banking. And we always blame the bankers. But nobody ever mentions the fact that banking is the most the most controlled, regulated industry in the United States. So if you know anything about economics, you go, oh, well, that's not surprising that the most controlled and regulated industry in the US is where all the crises happen. Just like public education fails, public banks are gonna fail, and our banks are mostly public. So in healthcare, we, you, government spent about 51 cents of every dollar. Banks are regulated to a degree that 70 to 80% of all their decisions are based on what the government tells them to do. There's only about 20% of freedom. So this is a wide phenomenon that, you know, government fails. The financial crisis is a good example of this, and you can ask me in the Q&A, but the financial crisis is a crisis of government from beginning to end, right? Government fails, we blame the market, and we do the things that cause the government to fail, we, we uh, double up on them. Okay, so, 
Uh, one aspect of this failure in, in I, know, I, know, I know a little bit more about finance and medicine, so I'll give you a financial example. One of the, one of the causes of the financial crisis, right, is Freddie and Fannie. And, and again, you can ask me if you want elaboration, right? So what do we do? Do we shut them down? Do we break them up? Do we privatize them? What do we do? No, we take them over, we make them part of government, and we grow them, and we make them even bigger, which is what they are today. They're much bigger today than when they were before the crisis. But that's always the pattern. It's always the pattern. And it never works. And we don't learn. Right? So stimulus packages. Right? Stimulus packages uh, are being tried for um, 100 years. They were tried in the Great Depression. They've been tried uh, all the time now in Japan for the last 25 years, they, since 91. Uh, so they've been tried over 21 years. They've been tried over and over and over again. How many times have they worked? None. Never. They've never worked. Never. But let's try it one more time. You know what Einstein called that? You know, you try the same thing over and over again, but expect different results? Yeah. Insanity. This culture is literally insane. Because we keep trying the same thing over and over and over again. So Medicare doesn't work, so let's expand it and cover all that insured under Medicare. You know, something doesn't work, let's grow it. Let's make it more. It's completely mind-boggling. And the question is, going back to this question of why. And my argument is that it's not a lack of economic knowledge, although there certainly is a lot of that. It's not a lack of history, although very few people actually know history. Because even if you think about the lack of economic knowledge and the lack of historical knowledge, you have to ask the question, well, why do people not have economic and historical knowledge? Well, because they're not taught it. And the question is why they're not taught it, because the intellectuals don't teach it. Well, why are the intellectuals so overwhelmingly anti-capitalism, anti-freedom, anti-everything that's related to markets? All of them, or almost all of them, right? You know, surveys at universities find that over 80% over of all faculty members on campuses self-identify themselves as left of center. And this center's pretty left to begin with. <laughs> it is. I mean, the center's moved in the United States from so the Republican parties, uh, on, on economic issues, the Repu Republican Party's uh, platform today is very similar to the Democratic platform from 50 years ago. And the Democratic platform today is very similar to the Socialist Party's platform from 50 years ago. The political center has moved dramatically to the left. And then when you try to argue from out here, you know, from the right, they say, well, you, you know, where's the bipartisanship and where's the working together. Well, they moved so far to the left, there's nothing to talk to them about. <laughs> or shouldn't be anything to talk to them about. But of course, they talk anyway. So I think the reason is a lot deeper, because it, 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 it's, a, it's, it, it's dominates in our culture, and, it, and it's all over our intellectuals. And the reason, I think, has to do with what a marketplace represents, and, and a marketplace in healthcare more so than anything else. Because what does a marketplace represent? What, what, what do people do in a marketplace? What do people go to the marketplace in order to achieve? What? Exchange. But why do we exchange? What do we go to the marketplace to exchange for? What's the purpose of that exchange? Self-benefit, self-interest, in some form or another, right? So the producers produce, they make stuff, they sell it, why? To, to make money because they enjoy producing it, because they want to, you know, Steve Jobs, it wasn't just about the money, right? It was about creating beautiful things, but it was also about the money because the profit margins in these things is well over 50%. He could have sold it a lot cheaper if he really loved me. Um, <laughs> it's about self-interest, you know, and I like, I like to, you know, tell the story. In 2008, I bought my first iPhone, and I went to the mall, and I bought the iPhone because I wanted, you know, the economy was deteriorating. I wanted to stimulate the economy. I wanted to make sure that people in the mall had jobs. <laughs> now, we go to the mall because we want to make our lives better, right? People come to you because they want to become healthier. You do what you do because you love what you do, and you make a living at it. You make a living. You're making a profit. Don't run away from the word. Profit is a good word. Good word. How do you make a profit? By providing somebody with a service or a good that they value and are willing to pay for. Why? 
because they value it more than the money they're giving up. So I buy an iPhone for 300 bucks, it's obviously worth more to me than 300 bucks, otherwise why would I bother getting up and going all the way there and, and giving them the 300 bucks? If they were worth the same, the trade would never happen. It's because the iPhone's worth more to me than that. The utility, the value it's gonna provide my life exceeds 300 bucks. So I'm willing to give up 300 bucks. When, when a patient comes to see you and folks over $150 or $1,000 or $10,000, it's because whatever service you're giving them is worth more than what they're giving you. When you provide a service to your patient, who's the loser? We are. Well, <laughs> I should have added, in the marketplace. <laughs> when there's a marketplace. Nobody. Nobody's a, I mean the whole, nature of market transactions, the whole nature of the marketplace, is we go into them to benefit ourselves, to make our lives better, and the other side does the same, and the result is a win-win relationship, is a win-win transaction. Trade, which is what you engage in, like every other producer in the economy, is a win-win relationship. It's a win-win transaction. Both parties are better off. That's true of every relationship in the marketplace. When I employ somebody, I pay them what? Less than what they're worth to me. I make a profit on every employee. How much are they getting? More than what their time is worth. Because they're taking the employment. I know we don't like to think about human beings this way, but that's the fact. Just as an aside, if you, if you create a minimum wage of 10 bucks an hour, who loses? Everybody who's only worth, i.e. can produce less than 10 bucks an hour, who will never find a job. And now you've institutionalized them into unemployment and poverty. And they'll never learn the skills to make 40 bucks an hour. So, just a plug against minimum wage. All one of the most evil laws we have in the books, because it hurts the people, the people explicitly it's trying to help, it's hurting them. It's hurting them, it's hurting them directly. And it's why a lot of jobs leave the country, but more importantly, it's why we get so much, you know what the unemployment rate is among teenagers in the United States? I mean, not teenagers, uh, what is it, 16 to 24. It's 18%, uh, but you know how much it is among uh, 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 black teenagers? It's in the high 20s. I mean, it's not their fault. They're just priced out of the market. It's our fault for passing such stupid laws. Well, stupid is, is a nice term for it. Um, no, because it's, it's malicious. It's, it's malicious. This is, this, is, this is bad stuff. So the, the marketplace is about these win-win transactions. It's about everybody pursuing their own self-interest. It's about making stuff better, right? I mean, the, the end result is a better result. And yet, how are these transactions characterized out there in the culture? Greedy, greedy meaning what? Greedy meaning exploitative. Greedy meaning negative. Greedy meaning somebody's losing, although nobody can actually point to anybody losing. What is it about these transactions that people find offensive? What is it about the marketplace that people find offensive? Well, it's, it's, well, it's chaotic, but it's not really chaotic, right? Out of the chaos, you actually get more order than you do where regulations are chaotic. Talk about, I mean, you guys know, just filling the forms is chaotic. Um, they hate freedom, but why? It's not, because it takes it's not fair. Why isn't it fair? What do we mean by fairness? Yeah, it's equality. It's, it, these are moral terms. What, are, what have we learned, right? What, have, what are we taught from when we're this big, right? What are we taught about morality? No, life is fair. It's inequality is fair. Equality is unfair. They have stolen this concept of fairness and completely and utterly destroyed it. Nobody ever thought that fairness 100 years ago meant equality. That's egalitarianism and Marxism brought that about. But there's no such thing because when are we all equal? when we're dead and decomposed. There's no such thing as fairness. The whole point is, there's no such thing as equality. The whole point is to make fairness unreachable and be able to, to, to knock everybody down in the meantime. But there is no such thing as equality. Equality, 
get animated on this one. Equality is an evil idea. It is one of the most evil ideas in human history. So I'm out of order here, but I, you know, uh, in terms of my, my talk, but uh, she said fairness, so. Why is equality evil? How do you make me equal to Michael Jordan in basketball? Force. Yeah, what kind of force? What would you have to do to Michael Jordan? You'd have to break his legs. He could still beat me. You'd probably have to break his arms as well. But that's the reality. How, how am I going to become equal to you in medicine? There's no way. There's just no way. Even if now I went to study it, it would take me, I mean, you, do, you never, when you advocate for equality, people who advocate for equality, never, ever, ever actually advocate for raising up the bottom. They always knock down the top because that's the only way to achieve equality. I can train for 100 years and not be as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. I'll never be. I just don't have it, right? But it, so what's the easy solution? Knock him down. That's what equality demands. That's why equality, the whole idea of equality is, is wrong and it's evil because it's about knocking people down. And if you want an image of this, the best historical example of a people who tried to attain equality is Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. Pol Pot went in there, they had a population of five million people, and he said, I want to achieve equality. I've got a lot of people who live in the rural areas, and I've got a lot of people living in the cities. In the cities, you can't achieve equality, so let's kick everybody out of the cities. Oh, but the problem is that those people in the cities are educated, and they're smart, and they, and they read, and they, they've got all this stuff. How am I going to create equality between them and the poor, uneducated peasants? Kill them. So he killed two million out of five million. Forty percent of the population was slaughtered in the killing fields of Cambodia. All in the name of equality. You know where he was, uh, you know where the Khmer Rouge uh, went to school? Yeah, the Sorbonne in France. They studied under the best Western philosophers who taught them egalitarianism and equality and Marxism. And they went and they implemented it. So that's the problem. The problem is we bought into these concepts. The problem is we believe in fairness. But it's more than that. What do we believe about self-interest? We believe it's bad. Because what's the moral ideal? What is the moral ideal in our culture? What does it mean to be a good, noble, heroic, virtuous person? Sacrifice. It's about selflessness. Think of yourself last. And this comes from all quarters of our culture. Selflessness is the ultimate virtue. So Bill Gates making the money, how much moral credit does he get? Nothing. I mean, he's considered either a neutral person or a bad person. From a moral perspective, think morality a second. He gives it away, now he's okay. Particularly because he's not working and making any more. God forbid that he make more money. He's giving it away. Now I have a bet going that I can, I, I can guarantee Bill Gates sainthood. I don't know if the Catholic Church will go with this, but cultural sainthood. What would he have to do in order to achieve sainthood? Give it all away, move into a tent, and if he could show some bleeding, it would help. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what we value. We think that that's goodness, nobility. It's sacrifice, and what does sacrifice mean? Trade, we said, was a win-win. What is a sacrifice? I give you something, and what do I get in return? Nothing. Nothing. So sacrifice is a lose-win. We idealize lose-wins, and we demonize win-wins. And that's bizarre. We demonize making money and creating wealth. We demonize that. We idealize giving it away. That's bizarre. How do you give it away if you haven't made it? And isn't making it, what do you think, what, what do you think Bill Gates helped more people? When he built Microsoft or by giving it away? It's not even the same ballpark. He's, Microsoft has touched every human being on the planet. Uh, networking, I don't know that we'd have an internet today without the standardization and so on. Microsoft touched everybody. I mean, I'm sure what Bill Gates is doing in his philanthropy is very nice and very good and he's saving and helping a lot of lives, but it dwarfs in comparison to the benefit he did humanity. 
at Microsoft. Yet, does he get any credit for it in Microsoft? No, why? Because he benefited from it. He engaged in win-wins. But now that he's losing, he's just giving money and not expecting anything in return, now he's a good guy. And again, I think he'd be a much better guy if he was actually suffering, if he could show that he was suffering by giving it away. Because you know what? He might be having fun with his philanthropy. And, and then, it's, you know, Immanuel Kant, the, the, the German philosopher, who I think has, has shaped modern philosophy more than any other philosopher ever, said that if you, in, 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 um, in making a decision, if you even, for a moment, think about how that decision would affect you, if you bring any self-interested motivation into your decision making, then it's not moral. Morality is only about the truly, purely selfless, the true sacrifice. You can't have freedom, you can't have markets, as long as you have that kind of attitude to morality. Because it does two things. The fact that we're all engaged in self-interested activities, what is that, what is that suggest to people. Well, that's, you know, Adam Smith, by the way, Adam Smith got this. Adam Smith, the Wealth of Nations, writes about this. The baker bakes his bread. And what Adam Smith said, don't worry about the ethics of this. He said, yeah, everybody's doing self-interested stuff, and we know that's not very noble and not very good. But if you aggregate it all up, then these visible hand makes everybody better off, and that's a good goal. So it's okay to engage in immoral activity or amoral activity because the goal at the end is a good goal, and it, nobody buys that. Nobody buys that. If what you're engaged with as a, as a, in these transactions is an ignoble activity, then they want to control it. They want to regulate it. They want a piece of it. So the two aspects that this, uh, that this manifests itself, which we talk about in the book. One is, what do we know about self-interested people? If they're not moral, what are they? And what does that mean? What, what does that mean, right? That they're going to lie, steal, and cheat. See, even though 99% of transactions, 0.999 of transactions in the marketplace happens without people lying and cheating and stealing, you're suspicious because these people are self-interested. And there's a suspicion. The best indication of this I got was, you remember, um, you remember a law called Sarbanes-Oxley? Probably didn't affect you guys that much, but it affected big businesses a lot. It probably cost the U.S. economy somewhere between 1.5 to 2 trillion dollars of economic growth, which is a lot. I know we're talking trillions now, it's not a big deal. Um, but why was it passed? It was passed because they caught a few guys um, like Enron and WorldCom and Tyco, uh, who were real crooks, right? And the conclusion was, the instantaneous conclusion was that people had was, oh, they're all crooks. We just happened to catch these guys. You guys watch Bill O'Reilly? So in 2002, I was on Bill O'Reilly's show, and Bill wanted to fire every CEO in America. Bill's, Bill's a populist, right? He puts his finger out in the wind. And so if you want to know what the American people are thinking, that's what you go to Bill for. Um, he wanted to fire every CEO in America because they're all crooks. Look, WorldCom, Tyco, and we, they're all for pro about profit. They're all self-interested. Therefore, they must be crooks. And that was the logic for Sarbanes-Oxy. Sarbanes-Oxy is a bill that basically puts a bureaucrat on every CEO's shoulder and every CFO's shoulder to look at the numbers and make sure they were all adding up. And how many crooks has it caught? Zero. Did it prevent the financial crisis? No. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's not enough regulation. That's the problem. So we treat businessmen, including doctors, as crooks. Insurance companies certainly are just waiting to steal my money. And we start controlling, and we start regulating, and we, we put the bureaucrat on the shoulder, and we can't do that, and you can't do that, and you, can't, and you have to report this, and you have to report this, and you have to report that. Just how you would treat somebody who is a crook, who you're still letting them go out there, but you want to monitor it, like the ankle bracelets, you know, they put on criminals. That's what regulation of business is. That's why they regulate. They regulate you because they think you'd be let out of the asylum and you're just about to exploit your patients. And it's why they do it to insurance companies. And the more profit you make, the more they want to regulate you, the more they want to control you. And it's all because they know that what you do is about profit. What you do is about self-interest. 
And that can't be right. There's something wrong with that, and we have to control it somehow. They is the culture, the people, the politicians, the intellectuals, it's everybody. It's us. To the extent that we don't fight it, it's us. Right? How did we get these regulations? I mean, they always happen the same way. You find one rotten apple, you conclude everybody's a rotten apple, you regulate everybody. The regulations create weird incentives that create, cause people to do you know, maybe shady things, maybe not. You find it not, oh, well, it wasn't the regulation that was the problem, we need more regulations. And f at some point, the industry's taken over. That's always the path. You look at every industry and you look at how it progresses. And it's all to control behavior. It's not to prevent market failures. What market failures? They can never point to an actual market failure. It's to Control. It's to keep an eye on. So that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is that if morality is about sacrifice, if morality is about being your brother's keeper, if morality is about other people's needs and you sacrificing for them, and particularly in healthcare, this one's an easy one, right? So there are people here who don't get as good of a healthcare as the people over there, right? So they need better health care. Who are you to say no? They need it. And it's your moral obligation, your moral obligation to give it to them. And it's only a small group today. We'll just start with a tiny, the really, really, really poor. Right? I mean, who could deny them? And you get Medicaid. Or they're really, really, really old. And it's not a huge group right now, and don't worry, it's just a small population, we'll give them Medicaid. That's what you had in the 60s. No, people weren't dying in the streets that you needed to adopt Medicaid and Medicaid. We adopted it because they, their health care, the fact is some people's health care is not as good as others. I drive a nicer car than a lot of people. We're not equal. <laughs> Equality is not a goal. But how can I not sacrifice for them? How can I not give some of my money to them? How can I not give some of my time to them? They need it, and that's what morality demands of me. It demands it. And then, you know, then there's another group, right? So we've given them, there's another group, and they still don't get quite as good of a health care as these guys. And, uh, you know, maybe they're stuck in between that gap between Medicare and insurance, and they don't, you know, whatever. CHIP is a good example, right? These are children, they're children. And they don't get Medicare because they're not poor enough, and they can't afford health, supposedly can't afford private health insurance. How can we, how can we deny them? So the Republicans passed CHIP, right? 80s. Yeah. And then the people who show up in the emergency room, and the emergency room turns them around and sends them home because they can't pay for it. Well, that's terrible. Here are people in need. And for a profit reason, for a self-interested reason, they're being turned away from emergency rooms. Again, I don't know how many real cases of people actually dying, but it doesn't matter. There's a need that's not going fulfilled, and it's your moral obligation to fulfill that need. So let's pass, you know, the law that requires emergency rooms to treat everybody and turn them into clinics in the evening, right? What's that? Mtala, yeah. That's how it comes. It always, it's always, and who can vote against it? That's why Republicans never do, because they've granted the left them all high ground. We've already said that you are your brother's keeper. We've already admitted that self-interest is bad and you should be selfless. Then giving them more is selfless. It's just a little bit of sacrifice, a little bit of taxes. And now we've got, I don't know, 35 million insured, whatever the number is, doesn't matter. They're not getting as good a health care as they should. All we're trying to do is make things a little bit more equal, is to help you become more moral, to help you satisfy the needs of people who really need stuff. And this is health care. They really need it. And how can anybody fight that? And nobody does. Nobody does. That's why the Republicans cannot fight on this pre-existing condition. Because that would mean some people couldn't get insurance, or not cheap insurance anyway, or not the kind of insurance they feel entitled to. And who are we to, 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 to do that to somebody, right? It's our moral duty, our moral responsibility to take care of them. So. I know this is an uncomfortable topic, but this is the core of it. If you can't stand up and challenge that, if you can't challenge the fact that their need creates 
a duty on you. If you can't challenge the fact that you are not your brother's keeper, if you can't challenge the fact that the no being noble is sacrifice, that selflessness is the moral ideal, then you cannot challenge socialized medicine. Socialized medicine is not and doesn't intend to increase efficiency. It's not and doesn't intend to make healthcare better. Socialized medicine is about taking care of those people who need it, and if it's at your expense, who cares? It's still the right thing to do. People don't vote their pocketbook. They don't vote economics. They don't vote what's efficient. People vote what they think is right, what they think is just, what they think is fair. And if they think fairness means equality, or if they think fairness means sacrificing one group for, another, for the sake of another group, then they'll go for it. They'll vote for it over and over and over again, and they won't stop. And that's the trend we've been going on for 100 years. In healthcare, maybe it's only 50 years, but for 100 years in the economy generally, that is the trend we've been going on. And that's the trend we will continue unless we're willing to challenge this ethical code. And to me, that is what Ayn Rand contributes to this debate primarily is that she rejects, and again, you'll get a lot more of this in the book, reject the whole idea that your life somehow belongs to others, that you're a sacrificial animal, that your purpose of morality is somehow for you to live for other people, that you are your brother's keeper. Why are you your brother's keeper? Rand says, no, you're your own keeper. Your responsibility in life, your moral responsibility in your life, everybody's moral responsibility in your life is to take care of themselves. Is to make their life the best life that it can be. To pursue their own individual happiness. To make of life, to, to use an Aristotelian term, to use Aristotle, to, to, to live a flourishing life. Aristotle's whole ethics is about human flourishing, individual human flourishing, how to achieve success in life happiness in life, that that's what morality is about. So creating stuff, right, building stuff, that's the good, being productive, taking care of yourself, making money, nothing wrong with that, contrary, that's good, because it means you're taking care of yourself. And more than that, it means you're offering a value out there that people value, right, because they're willing to pay you more than, it, more than what you put into it, that's a profit. Profit is virtuous. Profit is good. You're making your standard of living higher and everybody else's standard of living higher. Win-win. How can win-wins be bad? But self-interest, therefore, is a good. And self-interest is not about lying, stealing, and cheating. You know Bernie Madoff? Do you think he's self-interested? See, I don't think so. I define Bernie Madoff as self-destructive. Because self-interest, in my view, is something that you attain. It's something that's hard to achieve. Because it means figuring out what's in my self-interest. What is going to make me the best human being I can be? What is going to make me happy and successful over the, my lifetime? That's not easy. That doesn't mean, oh, there's money over there. I feel like it, and I'm just going to take it. Or the drug is over here. I'm going to snort the drug because it'll give me a high. That's not self-interest. That's not figuring out what's good for me. That's just emoting. And emoting generally, generally in life, living by your emotions is incredibly self-destructive. Everything we have, everything we create, all the values that we achieve are values of reason in the mind. So let's apply that to life. Life is about figuring out rationally what's good for me and doing it and living by it. So the idea is is if we, want to, if we want to be successful in a battle for freedom, right, for liberty, what we need is to reject a morality that's inconsistent with it, which is a morality of selflessness. And we need to adopt an alternative. And in my view, the alternative is a code of rational self-interest, a code of independent, responsible individuals pursuing their own success pursuing their own flourishing life, and interacting with other people on what principle? Mutual benefit, what Rand called the trader principle. Mutual benefit. 
Why? Because it's good for me. Why should I interact with you on a mutual benefit? Because I am better off. And if I expect you to lose in a transaction, any businessman knows this, that if you negotiate with one of your suppliers to the point where he's losing from the tr transaction, what is going to happen? You're both going to lose long term. Lose wins, lose, 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 are never good. Nobody benefits from them. Nobody benefits from them. So we need to stand up and reclaim them all high ground. We need to reclaim them all high ground in the name of win-wins, of the trader principle in the name of our own self-interest, in the name of our own happiness. And this is true for the healthcare profession, and this is the only way we're going to move towards a free market in healthcare, where we interact with one another as what? As equal participants in a transaction, which is win-win. Where we don't suspect each other of being lying, stealing, and cheating. Where we try to profit because profit is good, not bad. So that's the kind of world I think we need to move towards. Um, that is the kind of uh, more high ground we need to capture. And you know, I think that, you know, just to end on this, I, I think we're well positioned to do so because this country was founded on, on principles that are very consistent with this. It was founded on the principle that each one of us has a right, an alienable right that nobody can take away from you to your life, to your liberty, and in the most self-interested political statement in human ha history. Each one of you has an inalienable right to pursue his own happiness. That's the concept we need to fight on. Thank you all. So we have a few minutes for Q&A. I have a question. <laughs> um, do you make a distinction between forced charity, which is what Medicaid program is, and voluntary charity? Yes, absolutely. So I have nothing against charity. However, there's another distinction I want to make. So forced charity is wrong in my view. Force generally is wrong. Why is force wrong? What's bad about force? It's not in your self-interest, obviously. But what is, for, what is it human beings need, as I try to argue very briefly, human beings need their minds, need reason in order to survive, in order to thrive, in order to do well. Force is the enemy of reason. Force is the enemy of the mind. Force is what cripples you. If I tell you that 2 plus 2 equals 5, and I tell you you have to practice that principle, and if you don't, I shoot you, you can't build anything because it doesn't work. You can't think. You can't create. So force is the anti-mind, the anti-life, the anti-self-interest. So forced charity is immoral and wrong. Right. It's stealing. There's no difference between right. that and stealing. Um, you know, I like to use this example. You know, your neighbor, you know, your neighbor has a, 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 a really life-threatening medical condition, and they don't have the money to pay for the procedure. They only have two choices in life. Right? They, can come and they can come to you, me, and ask for the money. Right? Would you help me? And most Americans, history suggests, are quite benevolent and quite willing to help their neighbor. And that's the kind of charity I believe in. But they have a second alternative. And the second alternative is to pull a gun on me and to force me to pay them. Right? And that everybody in the culture, everybody in the culture knows is wrong. Knows is wrong. Somehow, we have this trick of mind where we go, okay, it's wrong of him to pull a gun and take my money, but it's okay for him to get all the neighbors together and vote to take my money. Then it's legal. Then it's okay. Then it's moral somehow. As long as the group is big enough, right, because we couldn't just do it in the neighborhood. You'd have to do it national. How does democracy make right, something that's a crime okay? It can't. Theft is wrong. It's always wrong. And Redistribution of wealth in any guise is wrong. It's theft. But I do want to make one more distinction, which you might not agree with. But anyway, I do distinguish between two forms of voluntary charity. Charity that you do out of guilt and duty, which I think is wrong, and charity you do out of a sense of benevolence 
out of a sense of valuing human life, out of a sense of your own values, your self-interest, which I think is good. I think philanthropy should be done in self-interest. And self-interest, remember, it's not about money. Self-interest is a spiritual thing. I mean, there are lots of things we do not because of money, right? For our self-interest. So charity should be in pursuit of one's own values, not because society expects it, not because you're commanded to do that by your moral philosophers, not because you feel guilty because you made a lot of money. Those are all bad reasons to give charity. So voluntary charity that's in pursuit of your own values, I'm all for that. I think that's wonderful. But remember, you know, there's this, uh, I'll just give you one, this one example. You know, you know micro-lending? Micro-lending is this, you, you go into very poor countries and you make very small loans to people. And, they, and there are two models. There's a non-for-profit model and there's a for-profit model. And it's been shown that the for-profit model works a lot better because the incentives are right. But people make a profit doing this. Guess who is perceived to be the good guys and who are the bad guys? Even though the profit model helps more people. The fact that you're making a profit does not mean you're not helping people. Quite the contrary, it means exactly that you're helping people. So it's not that you have to do charity and to compensate because you're not helping people when you're for profit. It's, you do charity because it's one more thing you want to do, but it's not to compensate. because it's, So you're not giving back. I hate that term. You didn't take anything. You didn't take anything. You're not giving back. You're giving because you want to give because it's a value to you for you to give to causes that you believe in. That's it. You got one there, two there. Yeah, I, I, it's, uh, words are so important, and there's two questions I have about words that are being bantered about in the media. Uh, the first, uh, can you tell me if you think there's any difference between these terms? Corporatism, crony capitalism, and fascism. <laughs> and the other question I have is, uh, what do you think about, because I've heard it from both parties, this, this disgusting term, shared sacrifice. Yeah, so corporatism, uh, corporatism is the idea that corporations run the world. It's silly. Um, and, and, you know, corporations are too involved in politics, but the fault of that is on politicians because they butt into, you know how many, you know how many dollars Microsoft spent on lobbying before the Justice Department went after them? Zero. You know how much they spent today? Tens of millions. Um, when Microsoft was spending zero, they were being harassed by Senator Hatch, a Republican from Utah, for not having their offices in, inside the beltway and not spending money on lobbying. And today, the firm that is being most harassed for not spending money on lobbying is Apple, because Apple spends very little on lobbying, and yet they are being harassed. There was an article in Politico, which is kind of the insider, about how, how horrible it is that Apple doesn't lobby enough. Right? So I blame the politicians, not the corporations, although after a while, the corporations buy into the model, and then they start, and then, then they call it crony capitalism. Now, I don't like the term crony capitalism, because it's not that there are different forms of capitalism. There's only one capitalism, free markets, true free markets. I call it crony socialism or just cronyism, right? Why, 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 why you know, besmirch capitalism? Let the socialist have it. Um, and cronyism is bad. Um, business should have no involvement in government. Government should have no involvement in business. Uh, most business today does it in order to survive as a self-defense mechanism, and then in order to capture rents, which they shouldn't. What was that? Fascism, you know, fascism is a system by which the government controls the means of production without owning them, but it controls them through regulation. In that sense, America is much more fascist than it is socialist. In socialism, the government owns the means of production. In fascism, they control it through regulations and through various controls. But fascism is also associated with racism and everything else that the Nazis and so on had. So it's not a great term to use. I like to use statism. We're a status. We're going towards statism. The state involvement in the economy is statism. And then I can't remember the second question. Oh, no, no, shared sacrifice. Shared sacrifice. I mean, sacrifice, in my view, is bad and awful and horrible because it involves losing when it's done individually. When you put a bunch of people to do it, it's all the more bad and evil. I mean. <laughs> If you're going to do something really bad, do it alone. <laughs> uh, 
Yep. Hi, Aaron. Um, just a comment, not a question. My son is six foot seven, and he went to high school. You're talking about your Michael Jordan yeah. comment. He went to high school in Canada, and he was prohibited from playing basketball yep. because he had an unfair advantage. Yep. They only let kids under six foot three onto the team because of that. Yep. And the good part of it, you know Ben Powell? Yeah. He studied, he's doing his dissertation uh, in public choice theory under Ben Powell now. As long as he doesn't so. become an anarchist like Ben is, <laughs> then you're, you're okay. But yes, uh, uh, today there are sports leagues for kids where they don't keep score. Because God forbid somebody should win and somebody should lose, right? Yeah, I know the kids keep score. Of course the kids keep score. Because no child believes in egalitarianism. <laughs> You have to be incredibly irrational as an adult to believe in egalitarianism. I think something that we uh, libertarian-leaning people have to promote is the way that our, um, our clergy has been hijacked by socialists and statists. And, you know, initially when the Christian terms were invented, there was no free market. Wealth was uh, taken by force. Big strong men would enter a country with weapons and take all the money from that country by force and enslave those people. So when their children of these rich people, like Nicholas of Myrna, when he gave away all, his, all the money, he had a spiritual benefit. And then he benefited, you know, like the three girls were going to be sold into slavery, and he made three gold balls, and that's where the three gold balls of the pawn shop come from. But anyhow, um, you know, there was a spiritual benefit, but there was no free market. And I think starting in the 19th century, our clergy started to get brainwashed in the seminaries that somehow the government taking your money by force and giving it to the state, and the state uh, takes, gives it to the poor, is somehow Christian, and it's not. So there's a, I, think, I think there's a broader principle here, and that is that, that it's true. Before the 19th century, the way you made money was by taking it from other people. There was no, there was no wealth accumulation through trade and through production. And, and they called the really rich, they called them robber barons. Why were they robber barons? This is before the 19th century. Because they literally were highway, they, they would put tolls on the highways, and they would steal people's money as they passed. And the barons were the rich guys, they were robbers. Right? Then suddenly something happened in the 19th century. We discovered capitalism. We discovered these uh, you know, uh, win-win relationships. But our thinking never got out of the 16th century. Right? And so we called the industrialists of the great industrialists of the 19th century robber barons because they became rich. And we couldn't conceive of the fact, or this is a very benevolent interpretation anyway, we can conceive of the fact that they could, made the money because we were still stuck in that 15th century thinking of the, if they have money, they must have stolen it. And to this day, we call them robber barons, but they didn't steal anything. Rockefeller, Carnegie, Vanderbilt, they built the stuff. They created the country that we have today. We wouldn't have this without Ford and Rockefeller and Vanderbilt and Carnegie. Everything we have here is due to them. They are the heroes of America. What? To, well, tell, uh, tell everybody, sent, I mean, remember the 1890 antitrust laws were, 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 were passed in order to attack them exactly because of the mentality of the Middle Ages that couldn't conceive that everything wasn't a zero-sum game. But capitalism changes the world. It turns the zero-sum game world into an ever-growing world. Have you ever seen, and I'll take the question after this, have you ever seen a graph of human wealth per capita? So there's a graph, famous graph of human wealth cap per capita. It goes, it goes back tens of thousands of years, and it's easy to do because for, for, it's flat. <laughs> Average per capita wealth is not that different. 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 300 years ago. It's basically flat. And then at some point it goes like that. Like that. And what's that point? Yeah, I mean, I like, to, I like to point to the, I like to use the year 1776. It's not exactly, because it's a little before that, but it's basically around there. And why 1776? Two things happened in 1776. This country's founded, which is the first real free country that allows for this win-win relationships to flourish. And secondly, an important book is published. 
Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations is published, so the first book about capitalism is published. And wealth takes off like that. But really what happens is the Industrial Revolution, which is capitalism, which is win-win, which is that for the first time we're not in a zero-sum world anymore, we're in a growing world. And nobody realizes, people talk about child labor in the 19th century. What, what were children doing before the 19th century? Starving. They were working on the farm 14-hour days and dying. Most kids didn't make it to age 10. They didn't. They didn't survive childbirth, most of them. So it, people don't know. Yeah, children were working in the 19th century, and it was a huge improvement over what they had before. <laughs> but nobody realizes where we were 250 years ago, where we've come from. I mean, look at us. I mean, this is amazing. We take it all for granted. <laughs> oh, they had politicians. Politicians have always wanted the same thing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> back in 2000, I read Atlas, <clears throat> Atlas Shrugged, and it was a huge turning point for me because I had absorbed all these ridiculous moral concepts um, and had believed them for you know the first 40 years or so of my life. And uh, it's because I read Atlas Shrugged that I stand here in the United States right now. I knew I had to move out of Canadian healthcare and move to the United States because of Atlas Shrugged. But um, in the lecture previous to this, um, I, w I don't know if you heard it or not, but it was about you know this maintenance or maintenance of uh, certification and the intern is being coerced into recertifying. But the thing that crossed my mind is that, you know, that's just one little issue, but it's just a symptom of a huge greater issue, which is that it's rampant in our, our culture that the way we achieve our goals is through, co through coercion. Yes. And that is a, a disease that's just a rampant everywhere. But look, that's right. Everything, coercion is everywhere in our culture. Yeah. And of course, most people think coercion is fine. Yeah. I mean, if, as long as you coerce people to do what's good for them, or to do good for other people, then it's okay. So a lot of libertarians, this is why I disagree with libertarians, a lot of libertarians say, we just agree on non-coercion principle, nothing else matters. And I go, nobody agrees on that principle. <laughs> nobody. No philosopher in history has agreed to the non-coercion principle because the fact is that they all believe that in order to do good, coercion is necessary. It's only if you understand the philosophical premise, the, the morality of self-interest, the role of the mind in human survival and human flourishing, and the fact that force is antagonistic to the mind, can you say, oh, well, yeah, coercion is bad. But coercion is fine for most people. They're fine with taxing you as long as they think it's going to benefit somebody. It's making you more moral. What's that? It is being made right? It's mediocre. How about that? The first one was mediocre. I haven't seen the second one yet. I think it's mediocre as well. But it's not awful, but it's not, it's not good. It's not as good as the book. Read the book. The, <laughs> there's, there's basic confusion in the human mind. And there will always be confusion, but there's confusion between the uh, freedom and the family and the synagogue, the family and the church. The government is considered to be a family. Uh, and the, the church, the synagogue, uh, the mosque, whatever, uh, there, there has to be that separation because the government is force and other things don't have the monopoly on forth, force. I agree with you, but again, I'll go back to the fact that we will never get that separation, not consistently, unless we have a change in the way we think about morality. And, and, and this morality is not just for the marketplace. This is a morality that's true for the family. I don't sacrifice for my kids. I happen to love them. So I give them a lot of stuff, including time. And that's not a sacrifice. Not going to the movies because you have kids is a sacrifice. No, my kids are more important than the movies. So if, if we have win-win relationships in, with, with your spouse. I mean, imagine that you had a win-lose relationship with your spouse. How long do you think that relationship would last? All right. <laughs> okay, let me exclude from discussion masochists. <laughs> All relationships should be win-win. <laughs> Otherwise, it's lose-lose. Okay, we have time for one more question. We're going to go to one of our medical students here who's cool. attending. <laughs> uh, so first of all, great book by you and Don. Loved it. Thank you. Um, I have a confession to make. I, uh, I, I lied on my medical school application. Um, <laughs> there's, there's always an essay. Every medical school application asks for an essay on altruism. 
and I had to explain why the volunteer time that I wanted to do, uh, that they wouldn't pay me to do, of course, because I didn't know what I was doing, that volunteer time was selfish. I had to explain why I did that out of altruism. And my question to you is... It's okay, nobody <laughs> 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 my, my, my question to you is, what do you say to a 20-something-year-old college student who decides he wants to go into medicine, just finished reading Atlas Shrugged, loves that idea, completely resonated with it, and then looks at the people who are in charge of medical school to even get to the point where everybody in the else in this room is, they have to go through that and be altruistic to even get to that point. Oh. That, well, but yeah, I mean, self-interest shouldn't involve lying, but if, if the conditions are such where lying is the only way where you can pursue your values and they have no right to, to force you on it, then you have to lie. But look, I mean, it's a tough question because I couldn't advise anybody to go into healthcare today. I mean, I, no, I'm serious. My father, my father is a great doctor. I mean, he was one of the, I mean, he, he was known in Israel as one of the great physicians in the country. He worked like a slave. I mean, he worked hours that are inconceivable. I mean, I work hard and I don't even come close to how hard he worked. He would work all day in the hospital because that's what you had to do, but the, the, the income from the hospital was nothing. You couldn't survive as a middle class family and income that you got from the hospital. So then he'd come home, grab a quick bite to eat at like five o'clock and then go and see patients from six o'clock to 10 p.m. And he worked from seven in the morning till 10 p.m. almost every day. I mean, and that, and he's still never, I mean, he's still not wealthy, right? I mean, he's okay in Israel, he's middle class. But that's it, that's what he had to do just to, just to do okay, right? Uh, it's, you know, if that's where we're heading, I couldn't recommend, I mean, I, when I was a little, I wanted to be a doctor, like most kids who have, and, and by the time I reached like 12 or 13, I looked at the way my dad was, no way, I'm not going to be a doctor. Um, and so it's, it's a very hard profession, given the direction, because, I mean, this is what drives me crazy, right? In my view, the, the two most important professions that we have out there are teachers and doctors, right? One takes care of the body and one takes care of the mind. And we want to cripple them both. One is already crippled. One doesn't, you know, doesn't exist as a profession because it's state, a state monopoly where public education just dominates, right? And there's no, as I said, there's no innovation, there's, no, there's nothing, and, and the kids are suffering. So we want to give that to the government, and now we want to take the second most important, the other most important profession and turn it into a government, a government thing. I mean, the injustice. And, and how much we'll all suffer as a consequence is just horrific. But this is why we have to fight. This is why there's a fight. But you know, you have to do what you have to do. Look, if you're in a classroom and the professor says, uh, and you know that if you say you like Ayn Rand, which is what happens to most philosophy students who like Ayn Rand, if you say you like Ayn Rand, you're gonna get an F, then you just don't say, you, you, you know, you don't do it. Because, I mean, he's irrational. You don't give him the, the, the benefit of dealing with the irrational. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we...